afternoon, amen? amen. You know, there's a lot of talk today about the concept of greatness. Yes. You know, we talk about going to a great restaurant, amen? Okay, restaurant. Maybe you're excited to go to one after this, amen? We talk about seeing a great movie, or a football team having a great quarterback, or a baseball team having a great pitcher. Of course, we talk about getting a great deal on maybe a car or some type of sale. A great dress, amen, sisters? We talk about making great grades in our academics. But you know, today I want to talk about building a great church, amen? And of course, we're going to do a four-part series on the book of Acts, and we're going to do an overview, so we won't read every single verse, but today, believe it or not, we will actually cover Acts chapters 1 through 8, amen? amen. And I want to, you to consider something today. Let's go to Acts chapter 1, get a little background information, and I'll propose my question to you here in a moment. Acts on, chapter 1. On, of course, Acts is written by Luke. In fact, some people have called Acts Luke 2, Amen. And we read here in Acts uh, chapter 1, in verse 1, he says, In my former book, Theophilus, now, the former book being the book of Luke, and of course, Theophilus, some have thought is maybe a, a royal official of some sorts that Luke was trying to convert to Christianity, though more likely it's a literary device, meaning Theophilus, Theo in the Greek being God, Philo being friend, meaning he's writing to all of us friends or lovers of God, amen? So this is a personal letter to you to chronicle the work of God. Now, they called it Acts originally because they said it's the Acts of the Apostles. And yet, I believe it should more accurately be called the Acts of the Holy Spirit, amen? Yeah. Because it's all about the Holy Spirit carrying the church. And we're going to read Luke's thesis here in a moment of how the church would spread. But he says that this is written to Theophilus, a friend of God. And he says, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach, verse 2, until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions to the Holy Spirit, to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. Jesus died on the cross. And I appreciate Ruth so vulnerably sharing about the impact that Jesus' death had in her life. But he overcame death. There's good news to the horrific story. He overcame death. And for 40 days, not talked a lot about today, he preached on one topic, a single focused topic, yeah. the kingdom of God. Amen. Yeah. And we've all studied that the kingdom of God was prophesied to come from the beginning of ages, from the books of Isaiah and Daniel and even some in Genesis. And what was the kingdom of God on earth from our first principles classes, guys? The church. The church. The church, the church is an expression of God's kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Amen? Amen. And of course, the church would start in Acts chapter 2. And so Jesus, for 40 days, was appearing and preaching, getting his guys ready for this church. You know, I believe with all my heart that to blow off church, to go, I'm just going to sleep in, I don't really care. Is to say, God, forget about what you prophesied from the beginning of time and prepare to be your body. Wow. You see, if we're going to build a great church, we got to believe the church is great. And today so many people trash the church. And yet it's the church is the body of Christ. We talk about the most holy organization on the face of the planet in a worse way than we do our job or our colleges sometimes. Whoa. And yet the church was God's very body, a body of Christ. You know, in verse it's interesting when you study this out because they still thought that the kingdom was going to be like a physical kingdom. And so they imagined Jesus coming, the early apostles, as this uh, David-type figure, like David in 1000 BC who ruled over Israel. They thought Jesus would be the same in the sense that he would overthrow the Romans and be, in a sense, the new Caesar and the Messiah in Israel would once again be big. But Jesus actually came to bring a spiritual kingdom, spiritual Israel, which is the church, his people, Jew and Gentile. And we can say amen to that. Amen, guys. Amen. And in verse 6, it says, so when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at the sign going to restore the kingdom to Israel? See how they still thought that there? It says, he said to them, it's not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends 
of the earth. Amen. And this is kind of Luke's thesis that the church would start in Jerusalem, expand to Judea and Samaria, and get to the ends of the earth. And that's what the book of Acts chronicles. They were to evangelize the entire world in their generation. Amen. Amen. You know, of course, if you're going to build a great church, then we need to obey my first point, the Great Commission. The Great Commission is what Jesus gave us, and we'll look at it here in a moment. But you know what's sad? There have been some people that have said that we are not to evangelize the nations in one generation. True. And here in Acts 1, 8, it says that the church was to get to the ends of the earth, and they would be empowered to do this by the Holy Spirit. Now, that term, the ends of the earth, does not just come from nowhere, guys. It's used in the Old Testament 42 different times. Wow. God always wanted the entire world to know about him. Israel was supposed to be a beacon of light. And yet, of course, they didn't live up to God's standards. And so we got Jesus. Amen. And we praise God for Christ. In the New Testament, it's mentioned two times. I'm sorry, six times. And two of those times are in the book of Acts. Let's look at the second time. Go to Acts chapter 13. In Acts chapter 13. And we're going to look in verse 44. And this is cool. Paul is preaching to the church in Pisidian, or preaching in Pisidian Antioch. And in Acts chapter 13 and verse 44, look at what this says here. On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. When Jesus saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and talked abusively against what Paul was saying. Then Paul and Barnabas answered them boldly. We had to speak the word of God to you first. Since you reject it and do not consider yourselves worthy of eternal life, we now turn to the Gentiles. For this is what the Lord has suggested to us, Amen. commanded us. I have made you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. Amen, guys. So Paul wasn't the only one that was to be a light to the Gentiles. Every Christian was given this great commission to bring the gospel to the ends of the earth. Now, I don't know about you, but the only time I can bring the gospel to the ends of the earth is in my generation. Amen. And so that's the mission of the church. Let's go to the Great Commission in Matthew chapter 28. Of course, Luke re reaccounted it for us in his version, beginning in Jerusalem, going to Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. And we read here the last words of Jesus in Matthew 28 in Matthew's account. And you know when someone gives you their last words, those words are important. You got to hold on to those. Amen. Now, these weren't the last words when he was on the cross, but when he resurrected and appeared to his disciples. And he says in verse 18, then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. Well, this is really powerful to think about. Jesus says all authority has been given to him. So do we have authority to change his plan? No, his plan is that one disciple, he's talking to 11 people. He goes, you 11, you need to get to all nations. Yep. Now, when did Jesus expect it to be done? In their lifetime. Could they do it when they're dead? <laughs> no. no, it's kind of like you tell your kid, hey, make your bed. You expect it to be done in your lifetime. Yeah. <laughs> in this generation, amen? <laughs> Don't mean 20 years from now or next week. Or you, you want it done now. You see, delayed obedience is disobedience. Yeah. Wow. And, and here Jesus says, I want to give you this commission to go to all nations. But how are they going to do it? Are they physically going to be able to get to every nation? No. no. You meet one disciple who makes another disciple who makes another disciple. And then you baptize those disciples. And after they're baptized, you're commanded to teach them to obey. Yeah. So that means every new Christian is to have a mentor, someone guiding them and teaching them to obey. And this requires the qualities of submission and humility and faith and trust. And one of the things our church is striving to do is to restore biblical Christianity. You know, every member of our church has a discipleship partner, amen? Where we're encouraging each other to get to the ends of the earth, and we see this all throughout the scriptures. Disciples make disciples who make disciples. It's the plan of God, amen? And so I want to propose this question to you as we go through this series. If everyone in the church was like me, what type of church would this be? How evangelistic would the church be? How pure would the church be? How righteous would the church be? If everyone in the church was like me, what type of church would this be? You see, he said, teach them to obey everything I've commanded. Now, what was the last thing he commanded here? 
Go make disciples. So that means this is not a commission just for the apostles. This is a commission for every single person who would call themselves a follower of Jesus Christ. You know, I, I'm so proud of our congregation. And if you're visiting with us, we're part of a fellowship of churches that began around 14 years ago. A small group of around 42 people came together in Los Angeles and said, we believe in restoring biblical Christianity and evangelizing the world in one generation. And you got a crown of thorns project when you walked in. I was around back then um, when I was in the LA church working as a minister when this was put together. And what they did at, at the beginning it was only phase one. It was just this part right here. And they said, let's target the key cities of the world. This is what they did in the book of Acts. That's why Paul wanted to get to Rome so bad. Let's target the key cities of the world because if we can get the gospel in those key cities and evangelize those cities, those major cities then can evangelize the surrounding cities. And those surrounding cities can evangelize the surrounding towns. And those towns can evangelize the surrounding villages. And we can get to all people, amen? Well, it's amazing because in 2009, Santiago, these used to all be red, meaning on, on the sheet, if they're red, they need to be planted. In 2009, Santiago was planted. In 2010, London was planted. In 2011, Sao Paulo, and then Mexico City. And, and it was amazing to see from this small group, now, 14 years later, this movement of God is on every populated continent of the world, over 8,000 disciples. That's amazing. You see, I want you to see that the early church was not an autonomous group of, you know, Christians just meeting in homes going, yeah, we don't know what's going on in the other houses next to us or the other churches and all this division and all this stuff that the garbage that we see today in the world. They were a collective movement of churches. You are part of something bigger than yourself. And only by working together with like-minded people with the dream of saying, we forget the creeds, forget the traditions of men. We want to be the movement of God. Amen. Amen. That's how we'll evangelize the world. And if you're visiting, I invite you to join us in this incredible crusade, this great commission. You know, it's not called the Great Suggestion. It's called the Great Commission. Amen. Of course, you have the Operation Eagle uh, sheet as well. We put this out a little later where we said we want to get a church in every state in the U.S. And this one's important because it's the U.S. that has the money to support all the foreign church plantings that we're planting. Very excitingly, our church for the first time in its history will be planting and giving birth to another church this year in August in Providence, Rhode Island. Amen, guys? And you know, it's incredible because I'm so excited for Calder and Cass to on, one day be appointed an evangelist and woman's ministry leader in God's kingdom. But I gotta ask, if you're asked to go, are you willing to go where the Spirit calls you to go? You know, we want to send a team of 15 people there to begin this new work of God with the Providence International Christian Church. Amen? You know, the plan of Jesus laid out in Acts 1-8, it would start in Jerusalem, go to Judea, go north to Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth. If we're to build a great church, we have to obey the Great Commission. So I've got to ask, are you obeying it? If everyone in the church was like me, what type of church would this be? You know, number two, they had a great message, amen? Go to Acts chapter two. They had a great message in Acts chapter two. Remember Peter, he's preaching to thousands. And, and he's preaching to these thousands of souls after the Holy Spirit had come and empowered them. And he says this about Jesus in verse 22. Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him on the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep his hold on him. See, he's preaching the gospel that wicked men nailed him to the cross, but he overcame death, which was the wage of sin. Amen. And we drop down to verse 29. Brothers, I tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried in his tomb is there to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was ahead, he spoke of the resurrection of Christ, that he was not abandoned to the grave, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life. And we are all witnesses of the fact. Amen? Amen? You know, guys, this really happens. This is not mythology. There's two essential things Peter draws out from his message here. One, that Jesus died because of the sins of all mankind. We know from Romans chapter 3 that we've all fallen short. And in that sense, we are murderers of Christ because he had to die for our sins. And yet he overcame the grave. 
This is incredible. And this is what separates Christianity from every other world religion. You can go to the tomb of Muhammad, and his bones are still there. You can go to the tomb of Confucius, and his bones are still there. But you go to the tomb of Christ, and it's empty, amen, church? You see, God, every other world religion teaches you've got to climb a ladder to get to God. Pray this many times a day. Be this good. Meditate enough to get to the state where you can attain and know God. And yet God goes, I'm going to become one of them. I'm going to feel their emotions, feel their temptations, feel their struggles, battle sin like they do, because I love them and I want to relate to them. Yeah. Die for you and I. Woo. Come on, bro. Yeah. That's the Lord we serve. Amen. A God that wants to know you personally and can relate to every single thing that you're going through in your life. He took all your sin in his body. You see, a lot of people want to hear the good news, but they forget to start with the bad news. And it's sad, so many pulpits, it's not popular to preach about sin anymore. And yet, that's where it starts. Right, a great message. How much did they believe this message? How much do you believe it this morning? Do you believe literally on the earth that you walk on, Jesus Christ walked with a real person and physically raised from the dead? You know, Peter, 50 days earlier, you know what he did? Denied Christ. Yeah. To a servant girl. Now, sadly, women were not treated well back then. You could have easily blown it off. But as Jesus was going to his death, the servant girl comes to, Jesus, to uh, Peter and goes, you're one of them. I can tell by your accent. He goes, no, I'm not. And in cowardice, denies Jesus three times to a servant girl. And yet, 50 days later, now Peter is preaching boldly with no fear before thousands of people totally transformed and changed. Why? The resurrection of Christ. You believed it. Wow. You don't die for a lie. Come on, Mike. In fact, he would die upside down, history records, before his wife in a brutal death under the Emperor Nero. Because he believed it. How much are you convinced and assured of the death, burial, and resurrection. There is movement out there by Satan today to fight against this message, this great message that transforms lives. And you've got to be prepared and willing to die for the cause of Christ. If you're a true disciple, 11 of the 12 original apostles died a martyr's death. And the one that did, he just got boiled in oil. That's the apostle John. It was suffering. It was a challenge. It was hardship. What was the response to this message? In Acts chapter 2, and verse 36. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The message produced a brokenness. What do we need to do? An urgency. And Peter goes, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. He didn't say, let's have an altar call and come forward and accept Christ into your heart. You won't find that in the Bible. He didn't say, get all your babies out and let's baptize them. He said, you've got to repent. Yeah. Yeah. Baptize for the forgiveness of your sins to receive the empowering work of the Holy Spirit in your life. Now, I'm so excited. Today, Mia has come to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Confessed her sins to the sisters, and, 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 and there was an urgency to make this happen. And uh, it's an honor to have her father with us today. Who, uh, I think parents are the ones that lay the foundation, and so you did an incredible job raising an awesome woman who loves God. But, but I'm so inspired, and I know there's other people that are studying the Bible, wrestling with that same decision. And I put before you those who aren't urgent about this decision don't really believe Christ died for them. Yeah. You say, no, I do believe that. I'm just scared, or I don't know. No, you want to hold on to your sin. Yeah. You don't want to change. When I was confronted with the gospel, I knew I had to stop looking at pornography. Yeah. Yeah. I had to stop lying. Yeah. I had to stop being impure. Come on. I had to decide I am going to walk with God and that I needed his grace. Are you with me right here? Yeah. And, and it makes you urgent because you need that grace. You need that help. Are you with me right here? 
Have you ever seen a boring baptism? No. no. You know what I mean? Like, like, oh, when's this gonna end? No, you're inspired. I mean, when Ruth was sharing, you go, this is incredible, you know, to see how God worked in her life. Yeah. Many Americans believe Jesus died for them, but their lives are no different than that of the world. Because they don't understand that Jesus died for their sins. And we need to have this conviction. You know, I believe with all my heart when we preach this great message, next there's going to be great numbers. Amen? Amen. Great numbers are going to come into the church. And as we've already seen, guys, I don't know if you understand, it is rare for a church to even double in a year. God allowed this church to more than double in one year. And there's so many people that keep on coming and coming. And, and I believe there's a revolution and a restoration of Christianity going on in New England. Come I believe on. we can define Christianity in New England. That it will no longer be an atheistic part of the country. But people see it as a Christian part of the country. Come on, Mike. When we have great numbers of souls come to join. You know, in Acts chapter 1, let's see where they started. Come on, bro. After three years of Jesus preaching, in an area the size of Rhode Island, Israel, in Acts chapter 1 and verse 12, let's see how many people they have. It says, Then they returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, and sat to stay walk in the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, John, James, and Andrew, Philip, and Thomas. And notice guys are listed in pairs, discipling in them. Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphys, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. And those days, Peter stood up among the believers, a group numbering about 120. Now, you remember last year we put out our vision to the church, 120 in 2020. You remember that? Yeah. And then, like, at the last minute, we hit it. <laughs> you know, God, God came through. Amen? Yeah. And, and it was amazing to see, because that 120 in the New Testament church formed the foundation for this incredible movement of God that would come. And he said, who are the 120? Well, they were the 11 faithful apostles. And, of course, they replaced Judas with uh, Matthias there in Acts 1. It was the women that followed Jesus, and significantly, Jesus' mother and his brothers, who we know from Mark 3 actually persecuted him when he got older. You remember that? His mom goes, you're out of your mind, and they tried to take him away. And now they're disciples after the resurrection of Christ. It impacted their life. And then, most likely, the 70 from Luke chapter 10, sometimes those are also called apostles because they're the sent out ones, but they were most likely part of this group as well. And these were an amazing group of people that were willing to die for the cause, praying, waiting for God's prophecies to come true. Of course, then Peter, Peter preaches that great message. And let's go to Acts chapter 2, verse 41. Acts 2 and verse 41. It says, those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. So, now how many are there? 3,120. Because it says the 3,000 were added to their number. Where's your school system? That's awesome. 3,120, right? So that's pretty amazing because now you have 3,000 added. And look at verse 42. This is significant. It says they. Now, who's the they refer to? How many? All 3,120 3, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the breaking of bread, the fellowship, and the prayer. Amen. All 3,120 were devoted, totally committed to God. That's incredible. They were indistinguishable from the apostles. You know, there's some people out there that go, well, I don't think we're called to be like the apostles. I go, yeah, you're right. We're not. We're called to be like Jesus. Come on, Mike. That's the standard. You're not called to be like a preacher. You're not called to be like your secular leader. Although the Bible says to imitate your leaders in the sense that they follow Christ. But you're called to be like Jesus. Yeah. And it's the same standard for everyone. Come on, Mike. You see, it's amazing. These 3,000 have the same commitment as the 120. And the 120 have the same commitment as the 70. And the 70 have the same commitment as the 12. And the 12 have the same commitment as their Lord, Jesus, willing to die for the gospel. Amen? Come on, man. Let's see what happened. In verse 47, Acts 2, 47, it says, The church was praising God, enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number, that 3,120, daily, those who are being saved. And I hope this afternoon you came to church to praise God and enjoy one another. Amen? And that's the type of group God will continue to add to when we have that heart. Well, let's see what happened. Let's take a survey of the book of Acts. Look in chapter 4, verse 4. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. But many who heard the message believed, and the number of men grew to about 5,000. Well, come on, brothers. That's awesome. Yeah. The men were leading the way. Is that awesome? Come on, bro. 
You know, it's so sad today. So many churches. You walk into church, the, the, the wife has to drag the husband to church. The husband's watching, you know, the stereotypical watching ESPN on, you know, the phone and the what. And, and you go to many churches and it's the women that are praising God and all fired up and leading the worship. And, and, and we believe women lead and do awesome things in God's kingdom. We love our sisters. Amen, guys. But you know, the men in the Bible were to lead the way. Yeah. That's a scriptural teaching. And I've been so proud. You know, up to this point, the men have led the way in the conversions. But as of the last couple weeks, the women have surpassed the men in the church. Let's give it up for our sisters. That's pretty awesome. But you know something? We don't want our sisters to slow down. Amen? We got Women's Day coming up in March. It's going to be awesome. But that just means us men, we got to speed up and lead the way in sharing our faith. And you see 5,000 men were added here at Acts 4, verse 4. You know, in chapter 5, verse 14, the scripture says, Nevertheless, more and more men and women, amen, guys, amen. believed in the Lord and were added to their number. Nevertheless, no excuses, just kept growing. Chapter 6, verse 1, in those days when the number of disciples was increasing. Well, that's how it needs to be in these days, amen? In chapter 6, verse 7, so the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased how much? Rapidly. Rapidly. And a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. You know, there are some people that go, uh, I want the church to grow slowly. Well, that's not biblical. The Bible grew rapidly. You want Bible results? It's going to take Bible effort. And few people are willing, uh, it's rare they're willing to pay the price for that. Come on. Come on. A lot of people go, oh, I don't like how we talk about numbers. Mm, come on. Well, there's a whole book in the Bible called Numbers. <laughs> <laughs> but you know people don't like talking about numbers because they don't have them? Yeah. And they miss like what, what, what every number. Sure, there's, there's the sin. Some people get so caught up on, on how big their group is. That's not what I'm talking about. That's a sin. But every number represents a soul. Right. Come on. You know, if the 3,000 being baptized, if, if Luke would have just wrote, you know, Hey, that day Peter preached and a lot of people were baptized. We'd go, hey, amen. And just kind of read on. But he said 3,000. We'd go, oh, my gosh. If Jesus fed, you know, in the feeding of the 5,000, we just said Jesus, you know, multiplied some bread and some fish. We'd go, okay, that's random. But the fact 5,000 were fed, you go, 5,000 men? I can barely feed a couple campus students at my house. Like, that's amazing. It shows the miracle. So we need to have a conviction on why we take stats as a church at our leadership meetings. And why? Because we want to make sure every soul is taken care of. And everyone is prayed for. And that no one is left behind. Can I get an amen as a church? Yeah. Amen. Amen. And what happens is the church grows rapidly. And it says a number of priests became obedient to the faith. Religious people were being converted. I mean, Daniel Linder is going to celebrate his one year yeah. spiritual birthday. Yeah. To be a pastor, serving in another church, Come on. Come on, the Holy Spirit worked through Mita, Come on, Mita. Come on, Mita. and Rosie there, on, Rosie. and Daniel walked in one day, and he, there's something different about this. There's something different about this church. Well, we studied the Bible, and he had the humility going to seminary, having seen God do all these different things in his life, to go, you know what, according to the Bible, I never really became a true Baptized disciple of Jesus. Wow. This man submitted himself to discipleship, was baptized, and in less, not even a year, he is now in the full time ministry. As a minister, serving the church of God. Amazing. You know, in chapter 8, verse 12, I mean, it continues. Um, let's skip that one. Let's go to chapter 9, verse 31. Chapter 8 is amazing. We'll get there a little later. But in chapter 9, in verse 31, look at what it says here. It says, Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace. It was strengthened and encouraged by the Holy Spirit. It grew in numbers, living in the fear of the Lord. Now they're at Samaria. Remember it said Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. So they got there. And then it's kind of cool. We find in chapter 13, the first great um, mission church from Antioch. In chapter 13, in verse 49, it says here, the word of the Lord spread through the whole region. So I want us to understand, guys, why we in our church uh, break down things in the region. Now, here is the, today where the downtown and the north are meeting together, right? Come on, come on. So Daniel doesn't just lead, uh, you know, the 30 souls in the north sector. He leads all the thousands upon thousands of souls in North Boston. Come on. Meaning that's the charge, the region he has been given to evangelize. Come on. Um, 
jo Joseph and Tyler, they don't just lead the, you know, however many students, 30,000, whatever, at Northeastern Boston University. They lead that entire campus because they are sent by the Holy Spirit there to preach the gospel. Yeah, right. And you know, we need more college students to raise up and lead yes. for God's kingdom. Come on. And I would inspire you, if you are interested in leading in God's kingdom, to personally come talk to me. Come on. And let's set up some coffee time because we believe with all of our heart that God has you here for a reason. Are you looking right here? You know, when you look in uh, chapter 14, verse 1, it says that Iconium, Paul, and Barnabas went as usual into the Jewish synagogue. There they spoke so effectively that a great number of Jews and Gentiles believed. Okay, so they come in, and the Bible says that they speak so effectively that great numbers of people believe. We're talking about great numbers. Um, this is important. This is why we did our first principles class, guys, because learning how to communicate the gospel in an effective way can directly proportion how many souls come into the kingdom according to this verse. And so it's important that we grow in our knowledge. You know, in chapter 14, verse 21, you guys seeing a pattern here? They preached the good news in that city and won a large number of disciples. Now, this is really exciting. Look in 16, verse 5. The Bible says, so the churches were strengthened in faith and grew how often? Daily. daily in numbers. Not only was the Jerusalem church growing daily now, but all the smaller outlying churches were now growing daily. Wasn't it cool a couple weeks ago that we experienced for the first time since we've been back daily additions yeah. in God's church? We saw seven added in one week. Wow. I believe that will become a normal thing here in Boston yeah. when we are doing the Lord's work. You know, if you go to chapter 17, Come on, Mike. Come on, Mike. in verse 6, you know, they're always running into trouble. There's always going to be persecution that follows you. We'll see that even more. But in chapter 17 and verse 6, the Bible says this. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some other brothers before the city officials, shouting, These men who have caused trouble all over the world have now come here. I love the Revised Standard Version. It says, These are the men who have turned the world upside down. Come on. I mean, their message was just rattling the world. And by the time you get to Acts 28, Paul is in prison. He's on house arrest in Rome. Yep. And the Bible says that everywhere, people everywhere in Acts 28 are talking against this sect. Another word for a cult. You know, if anyone ever says you're part of a cult, you just go, amen. I'm in good company with the Bible. Amen. <laughs> uh, at the end of the day, they got persecuted. They got called a cult. Paul was called a ringleader of a Nazarene sect. They, they were viewed as, as the outliers, the strange ones. They did, the, the world didn't understand them. And yet God was with them. And significantly, Paul writes while he's in Rome, the book of Colossians. And let's look, go over there. Let's look at what he writes here. Colossians chapter 1. The church started in 29 AD. And now this is 62 AD, some 30 years later. And in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 6, look at what the Bible says. All over the world. This gospel's bearing fruit and growing, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and understood God's grace in all its truth. Drop down to verse 23. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, not moved from the hope held up by the gospel, this is the gospel you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, have become a servant. Guys, they accomplished it. They evangelized the nations in their generations. That hot of what, guys? Yeah. That didn't mean every single person became a Christian. That doesn't mean in our day that everyone goes through the study series. It just means that every single person heard about the body of Christ. They heard about the gospel, whether through good report or persecution. And see, guys, if we're going to evangelize the, gener the nations in our generation in the 21st century, we got to have a conviction that great numbers need to be coming into God's church because numbers represent souls. This wasn't just some random church, autonomous churches. This was a movement of churches that worked together with like-minded people to share their money, their resources, their people to expand the gospel around the world. So my question is, if everyone was like me, how would the church be? How did they do this? I believe our next point, great boldness. Go to Acts chapter 3. Great boldness. Acts chapter 3, we read this powerful story in verse 1. It says, one day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer. At 3 in the afternoon, now a man crippled from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg 
from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at them and as, as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have. And maybe you can relate, campus students. Amen, guys. <laughs> Come on, campus. But what I have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Take him up by the right hand. He helped him up. And instantly, the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. While the beggar held on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished and came running to them in the place called Solomon's Colonnade. This is beautiful, guys. This beggar who never walked, been crippled, is begging for money. And Peter and John use it as an opportunity to present to them Jesus. Of course, God's miraculous power works. And the man can walk again. And he's so fired up that he's jumping up and down, praising God, the Bible says. So excited. And people are astonished, you'll see later, that an old man like this could jump up and down like that and praise God. And I love verse 11 because it says, well, the beggar held on to Peter and John. He just did not want to let go. Some of you have experienced miraculous things physically, amen? But, you know, for a lot of us, we've experienced miraculous things spiritually. Where we were baptized into Christ and healed from our sins. And I want to encourage you, hold on to those who taught you the gospel. Hold on to your discipleship partner and learn and be humble and be taught to obey the word of God. Look what happens in verse 12. When Peter saw this, he said to them, Men of Israel, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. You handed him over to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. You disowned the holy and righteous one and asked that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this. Is this great boldness or what? He is saying, man, unashamedly, you killed the author of life. And they were so astonished that this man could be walking. You know, look in chapter 4, verse 1. Chapter 4, verse 1 says, the priest and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were still speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. But many who heard the message believed, and the number of men grew to about 5,000. Well, this is exciting. Literally, they put the apostles in jail, but the thing just keeps growing. They couldn't stop this thing. It was like COVID-19, you know, just expanding and going everywhere. That was like the gospel. It was just spreading everywhere and they could not stop it because the movement of God always forcefully advances. Verse five, the next day, the rulers and the elders of the teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Ananias, the high priest was there. So was Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and the other men in the high priest's family. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them. By what power or what name did you do this? Guys, here's Peter, who had the guts to preach to thousands at Pentecost, but now he's brought before the Sanhedrin. This was the religious elite of their day. This was Israel's uh, theocracy. Um, Its leaders were not just religious, but intellectual and the government of their day. And you see even Caiaphas there, who was there with Jesus' death. And so this is who they're brought before. I mean, just put yourself in those shoes and imagine the intimidation of that situation. And let's see how our brother... Peter responds. They try to intimidate him by, what power are you doing this by? Well, in verse 8, then Peter filled with the Holy Spirit. And you can only be filled with the Holy Spirit by prayer and getting in the word. Amen. Amen. Said to the rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a cripple and are asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, 
that this man stands before you healed. He is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the capstone. Salvation is found in no one else. There is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. And the church says, Amen. 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 Wow. Woo. This is bold. Like, understand what he's saying, guys. He's saying, you don't believe Jesus? You're lost. Salvation's found in no other name but Jesus. Come on. We lack the boldness to preach the exclusive message of Christ. Wow. And a generation that Wants to everyone to be okay. Yeah. Who were these men? What did the, the religious elite of the day, what did they see when they saw these guys preaching? Look in verse 13. This is powerful. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and to know that these men had been with Jesus. Ordinary men to extraordinary Come on. That's what God intends for all of you here. Unschooled. Ordinary. Ordinary in the Greek is the word idiote. It's where we get our word idiot from. Oh, man. They saw these unschooled idiots. Fine. But they go, there's something different. They are courageous. And they took note. They go, oh my gosh, this reminds me of someone. They've been with Jesus. When people see you in your classroom, when they see you at your job and on the football team, wherever you're at, do they take note you've been with Jesus because of your boldness? Wow. Some of us were ashamed to pray in public. We like the mask now because we just kind of walk around covering it. We're ashamed to really be bold in our faith and preach the word of God. How did these guys go from ordinary to extraordinary? You know, John wrote some of the most eloquent Greek we have. And these were just fishermen. They sat at the feet of a rabbi named Jesus who mentored them and trained them and teach them. And he goes, this is my plan that you guys will mentor and teach others. And guys, you can change. I remember I did not like to read when I became a disciple. I go, well, I have to read because I have to have my quiet times. Amen. Now that I'm a Christian. So... I started reading my Bible, and I fell in love with reading, and now I read books all the time. Come on. You see, God, when you, when you sit at the feet of another mentor, another Christian, and allow them to teach you and train you, you become more like Jesus. And people take note. They go, this guy's different. Ordinary to extraordinary. That's what discipling does. Look at chapter 4, verse 14. Come on. Come on, bro. This is awesome. But since they could see the man who had been healed standing there with them, there was nothing they could say. Don't you love that? When you get persecuted, guys, from your family, your friends, just let your light shine, and they won't be able to say anything at some point. Verse 15, so they ordered them to withdraw from the Sanhedrin, and they conferred together. What are we going to do with these men, they asked. Everybody living in Jerusalem knows they've done an outstanding miracle. We can't deny it. But to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, we must warn these men to speak no longer to anyone in this name. Wow. They figured it out. They were the brightest of the time, the Sanhedrin. They actually figured out how to stop Christianity. And they did. They go, if we can get them to shut up, to stop sharing the message, the movement stops. And that is true. When you stop sharing your faith, you become a dead-end Christian and the movement stops with you. They figured it out. The violence of silence and what it does to someone else who could become a Christian. We don't say anything. Well, hopefully we respond like our brothers did. Check this out. Verse 18. Then they called them in again and commanded them, not to speak or teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, judge for yourselves, whether it's right in God's eyes, sight to obey you rather than God. For we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. Is that awesome, guys? After further threats, they let them go. They could no longer decide how to punish them because all the people were praising God for what happened. For the man who was miraculously healed was over 40 years old. They go, wow, an old guy was healed. That was miraculous. Amen. <laughs> old guy. I'm almost that age, so amen. All right. What's awesome about this, though, guys, is that they were blown away by the miracle, and the Sanhedrin, the governor of Israel, figured out if we can quarantine them, and get them not to speak, it will stop. I've got to ask you, in the midst of the lockdowns we had last year and stuff, have you stopped sharing your faith as much? 
or do you go, we must obey God rather than man? We want to ask people to come to church with us because we believe when they come to church with us, they are going to experience the power and the courage and the boldness that's in all the disciples. Because the courage and the boldness doesn't come from us. It comes from the Holy Spirit. They couldn't help but speak about it. For you, can you not help but speak about Jesus? You know, I had something happen recently that just bothered me. I had one of those situations, you know, I was at the airport and I just go, I feel like I'm supposed to share my faith with this person. I saw them at the hotel we were staying at in Florida. And then I saw them again in Boston. I was like, that's unique. But I need to confess to all you guys, I gave in to cowardness. I had planned to share it with them. And I was like, okay, let me just wait till the baggage comes. I saw them at the other side. But at the time my baggage came, I hesitated. I didn't respond to the Holy Spirit. And, you know, I just knew I disappointed the Lord. I praise God for grace. I don't believe we should stay in a place of, you know, open around. You've got to repent and learn from it. But, you know, have you ever been there where you just felt like the Spirit's telling you to share with someone you don't? You're in there in the Uber with the car driving. You know you should share your faith and invite them to church, and, and you don't. You sit next to that person every day in class, and you don't talk to them. We need to respond to the Holy Spirit. I want to call our church to be a church that's filled with the Spirit of God. Yeah. That we just can't help but speak about what God has done. You know, in Acts 4 and verse uh, 23. You guys still with me here? Come on, yeah. oh Look at this. They're released. And it says, on their way, they're released. Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. And they go on and pray, guys. This is awesome because they come back and they do what we do a lot of times when we come to our meetings. They share good news together. Amen. And they, 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 they praise God. And then they pray to the Lord and they say, sovereign God. Now that term sovereign means that God is in absolute control and power. Everything that happens in life, either God makes happen or he allows to happen. So there's no way you can get bitter against God because you know that God's always working for your good. Amen? Amen? Even through the challenges, even through the hardships, even through the things Ruth shared. When she shared that today, didn't it move us? And so God, what man and Satan intended for harm against her, God used for his glory Amen. so that more souls could come yeah. to know him. And they said, sovereign God. Now they didn't pray, God, take away the persecution. It's too tough, so hard, make it easy. What did they pray? Look at this. Drop down. Verse 29. Now, Lord, consider the threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand and heal before miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. Amen? He said this, that they prayed, God, enable us to speak with boldness. Wow. Wow. Make us strong in the face of opposition. Come on, bro. We need to pray these radical prayers that shake the foundations of the earth and fill us with God's spirit so when we go out and preach the word, God will move. Amen. Nice. I've been so proud of some of the sisters in our church. You know, Jocelyn and uh, Ashley and Lovely, who uh, they were at our 9 a.m. service this morning. But you know what they did, guys? They went out and they just went out and preached the word. They even made signs that said, hey, anyone want to study the Bible? And it was so awesome. Uh, one sister came up to me afterwards, and she goes, dude, you won't believe it. Ashley goes, we, we set up a Bible study from our time. <laughs> Is that what I <laughs> It's the boldness to go out and, and share the, the word of God. And, and I'm not saying you have to be some fanatic or mean like some of these guys you see out there. We just need to go out, and we need to share the message. I sense Peter and John were just passionate about God and wanted to help and serve and love the community. Come on, Mike. And that's what we got to do. When you pray for great boldness and you go out preaching, God works. Look at Acts chapter 4. Let's go to verse 32. Come on, bro. Awesome, bro. Our next point is great power and sacrifice. If everyone in the church were like me, what kind of church would this be? Well, we need great power and to have great sacrifice. Look at verse 32. Persecution has a way of uniting people. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of his possessions was his own, but they shared everything they had. 
With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and much grace was upon them all. There were no needy persons among them. From time to time, those who owned lands and houses sold them and brought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to anyone as he had need. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. Wow. Great power and great sacrifice. You see, as he preached the great message, miracles happened in the church. And the unity was so powerful that it says they, not, they didn't claim any of their possessions as their own. I mean, that's pretty awesome to think about, guys. You guys know that um, I have an SUV in the church. <laughs> you know, I thought you didn't have a car. Well, no, I, I, I do. I, I have a van in the church as well. I have Joseph's van, amen? Yeah. I have the Tahoe, of course. Is, uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, they have my possessions as well. Hey, man, hey. That, that's the heart of the early church. They didn't share anything on their own. I don't think this was some weird communist thing where they all lived together or something. I'm not saying that. I think we need to respect each other's possessions. The idea was that when there were people in need, people stepped up to the plate. Now, this is amazing. There was one guy who was so encouraging the church. His name was Barnabas. And he sold land to get money to meet the needs in the church. And back then, they didn't pass the plate. They just brought it to the leader's feet there. <laughs> I mean... Gosh, you want persecution? We started doing that. that. That kind of flipped things around, wouldn't it? But, but, but they just had this trust and this heart that they were family. And what was amazing about it is they bring this money. And this guy named Barnabas, they go, you know what? He, we're going to call him the son of encouragement. Because of how encouraging his financial sacrifices were for the church. You know, um, there's a Mainline Church of Christ article that came out many years ago here in Boston. And the article said, talks about this church that just raised $1 million for a new church building that they were going to build. And he talks about that, and he, and he ends the article, and he goes, who's going to be the first church, though, that raises $1 million purely for mission work? Uh, Kim took that challenge, um, the church we broke off of, our former fellowship, when he lived here in Boston. And he goes, you know what? I see that as a challenge for God. So he put it out before the church. That time, the Boston Church of Christ. They wanted to raise a, a million dollars for mission work. And it was so amazing in the church what they did. Uh, Kip sold, sold his coin collection uh, that was valued. And, and when one brother heard him preach about selling his coin collection, he comes up to him and he goes, man, bro, I'm just so bitter at you. I'm just, I have a bad attitude right now. That's what he said. And, he, and Kip goes, why? He goes, well, because, no offense, but my coin collection is worth more than yours, and, and now I know I need to sell my coin collection for missions. <laughs> of course, you know, he repented and had a good heart about it, amen? But you know, I think the early church, they just, they just had this heart of sacrifice. Yeah. One sister in that church in Boston sold her prized horse that she grew up with. Elena sold her diamond ring and her ring, and to date, wears one that's fake. Because she wanted to give. For missions. One couple in the church sold their home and gave all the money for missions. We want biblical results, but are we willing to put in biblical sacrifice? Who's going to be the hero in the church that goes, I'm going to sell my PS5? <laughs> sell my PS5 for missions. I know a lot of us don't have houses here. In the <laughs> <laughs> and I can have one thing there. But you know what's going to happen? Some hero's going to step up, going to inspire the faith of someone else. Someone's going to be playing their Xbox and go, you know something? I probably should do the same thing. Well, of course. Come on, Xbox. And we hold on to these possessions, and yet that possession could be another soul in India. Wow. That's true. True. Great power. Come on, bro. Great sacrifice. You know, we, we think, uh, you know, oh, let me get a fundraiser. Guys, fundraising's not going to cut it. I'm just telling you, we're trying to raise $120,000 for the Lord. You're not going to go out and fundraise all that. If you do, I will praise God. God can do anything. Amen? But you know, it's going to take being like the early church, personal sacrifice. It's going to take personal sacrifice. And I really want to lift up a Barnabas, a son of encouragement in our church. And that's our brother Forrest. Come on, Forrest! 
course, is a, a Boston University student, and, and Come on, Forrest. you know, the thing I appreciate about him, I don't want him to lose his reward in heaven, but he's raised thousands of dollars for the mission's work. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I'm really impressed with the campus ministry and their heart to yeah. really raise a lot of this 10,000 plus dollars we've raised has been from the college students. Come on. Yes. So I really got challenged. You know, I was thinking about it. I think the single professionals in the church probably have better jobs than the campus students. Yeah. I'm just guessing. And I want you to be inspired by their sacrifice. We need more Barnabases in the church. Are you with me right here? And I know some of us are waiting for the stimulus check or those taxes or whatever it might be. But I really want to put that call out there, guys. I believe by April 18th, we're going to give a fragrant offering to God. And it's going to be beautiful what the Lord does. You were the first last year to give your missions in the entire movement as a church. I believe this year we could do the same thing. Are you with me right here? But you know, there was one couple that held back. And we'll be coming in for a landing soon. I know today's a lot longer than normal. Look in Acts chapter 5 and verse 1. Our next point to build a great church is great fear. Again, if everyone in the church was like you, how sacrificial would the church be? You know, in chapter 5, we have one couple. It says in verse 1, Now a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. Now if you just stop right there, you go, man, that's pretty awesome. Like if someone came in here and said, hey, we sold a piece of property for the Lord, you go, oh my gosh, that's incredible. I haven't done that. But let's read on and see what happens. Verse 2. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart? that you've lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept yourself some of the money you received from the land. One quick note is you see a contrast being made by Luke here as people that are filled with the Holy Spirit versus here people that are filled with Satan. Mm. And you're going to find here in a moment, the issue wasn't not giving enough money. That wasn't the issue. The issue was giving the appearance of being sacrificial, but not being honest and open about your heart. Are you with me right here, guys? Mm. Verse four. Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You've not lied to man, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. And great fear seized all who heard what happens. Then the young man came forward, wrapped his body, and carried him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what happened. Peter asked her, tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? You find, guys, great leadership always gives people the opportunity to repent. Yes. And I think this was loving. I think he wanted to give her a chance to confess it, just like God did in the beginning with Adam. Hey, where are you? It's not like God didn't know. But he wanted to give him a chance to be real. He said, she says, yes, she said, this is the price. Peter said to her, how could you agree to test the spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out also. At that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. Then the young man came in, finding her dead, carried her out, and buried her beside her husband. Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. Great fear. You know, if you're going to build a great church, we have to have a great fear of God. Great fear of God. The sin here was that they did not fear God. They allowed deceit in their life. They weren't transparent. They were open. You know, in Revelation 2, if you just turn there real quickly, keep your finger there. It's interesting. God addresses this church in Thyatira. And without getting into all the details, I'll just read this in Revelation 2 in verse 20. Look at what he says to this church. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual morality and the eating of food sacrifice idols. Wow. This is crazy. This church tolerated people teaching that it was okay to sleep outside of the marriage covenant around. Now, guys, understand we're all going to have sin. First John 1 says, if you claim to be without sin, you're what? Fine. So that's not the issue. I'm not, I'm not saying you, you, you can't have sin. The issue for this church was the toleration of sin. Tolerating these types of teachings in the church. And we gotta understand if we're gonna be disciples of Christ, we gotta have a fear of God. Exodus 20 20 says, The fear of God will keep you from sinning. Amen? Yeah. Is there sin in your life you need to be open about? Pull a brother or sister aside and go, You know what? I just need to be open about. We must also have be our brother's keepers in the congregation. Yeah. 
We got to have the conviction, guys. If we see sin in each other, what's the Bible say to do? Call it out in love. Matthew 18, 15 says, you talk to them one-on-one. -on -one. Too many people call me, hey, bro, brother so-and-so's in sin. I go, you know what I always say? I go, well, did you talk to them? Well, then I shouldn't even know this yet. And too many people call their sector leader, call their minister. And you know why? They're conflict avoiders, cowards. Yeah. Yeah. And you're going to have great courage in God's kingdom. You've got to confront the person in love and say, hey, you know, let me show you some scripture. Let me help you, bro. Now, Matthew 18, 15 goes on. I'm teaching this because we have a lot of young Christians in the church. Matthew 18 goes on. If they don't change or you can't get reconciled or maybe they disagree, then you pull in another spiritual leader. Are you with me right here, guys? Yeah. That's Jesus' plan to bring unity and reconciliation in the church. But we got to fear God. When we fear God, we go, I want to make sure my relationships are right. I want to make sure my purity is right. I want to make sure that I'm walking and not tolerating sin in our lives. So let's have a conviction church to challenge sin. Amen. You know, it's interesting. If you go back to Acts chapter five and verse 12, look at what it says. The apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders among the people. And all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade. No one else dared join them, even though they were highly regarded by the people. Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. See, when the church has a fear of God, the church continues to grow. Now, some people have been confused by the verse above where it says that no one else dared join them. And then the very next verse, it says it continued to grow. Well, there's no contradiction. It's making the point that no more phonies and frauds join them anymore. You see, a fear of God helps bring a purity to the church. Wow. Again, we're not talking about perfection. We're talking about purity, which deals with openness and transparency and the heart and being the real deal. Can I get an amen on that? Yeah. You know, the church had a great leadership. Go to Acts chapter 5. We're going to drop down for time to verse 38, as I planned here. And what's interesting is that the apostles get put in prison. An angel of God frees them. And then they get put back in prison. Amen? Yeah. You know, you just got to get used to persecution. You're going to do great things for the Lord. And it's interesting because they bring him before, you know, the Sanhedrin again. And one of the guys who would later train, he trained the Apostle Paul, we find out later, named Gamaliel. He stands up and he says this in Acts chapter 5, verse 38. This is a powerful verse. Therefore, in the present case, I advise you, leave these men alone. Let them go. For if their purpose or activities of human origin, it will fail. But if it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourselves fighting against God. His speech persuaded them. They called the apostles in and had them flogged. Then they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Guys, that's what Ruth described earlier from the medical account. Mm -hmm. They experienced the flogging. Mm -hmm. And let's see how they responded. Let's see if they went and complained about their day or how bad it was. Mm -hmm. Verse 41. The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. Day after day and in the temple courts, and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Christ. Is that awesome, guys? Right. See, we're talking now about great leadership if we're going to have a great church. The apostles are put in prison, as I said, then brought before the Sanhedrin. And yet they see even someone amongst the Sanhedrin recognizes if, if, if this thing's of God, we're not going to be able to stop it. Right. How bold are you at your work, at your high school, on your campus? Are you willing to endure persecution? They were heavily persecuted to the point of flogging and being told not to speak. Leadership cannot give in to the world, guys. We need to have leaders that preach on the tough subjects of the Bible and the church. And they're not afraid. I really want to call more people to come to our leaders meeting. We have leaders meeting today at 2 o'clock. And I really want to inspire you to come if you're interested in leading in God's church. Today we're going to be talking about the children's ministry. But we need leaders who are bold. And you know, believe it or not, did you know the church had problems even in the early church? No. no. Yeah, I know, I know, it's shocking. For a lot of us, we get baptized, we come to the church like this, we go, man, it's, it's like heaven on earth. Everyone's so loving and they're hugging, these are my best friends. And then someone sins against us. And we're like, oh my gosh. I thought this was the kingdom of God. <laughs> and I go, buddy, the churches are perfect. It's filled with imperfect people. You go, why? Because you're in it. <laughs> and I'm in it. And we have sin. And we sin against each other. Yeah. A family never quits on each other. Right. You know, in Acts 6, we see this problem. Verse 1. 
In those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Grecian Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, It would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith, and the Holy Spirit, also Philip, Prochorus, Nicnar, Timion, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them, so the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. In any fast-growing church, you're going to have problems. And we are certainly not above the church here in the book of Acts. And understand that they had problems because people were being overlooked. And that's one of the dangers we face right now as our church is growing increasingly fast. We were one of the fastest growing churches, guys. And understand that people are going to be overlooked at times. But you don't just leave it like that. Great leadership comes up with a solution so every soul can be taken care of. And what's the great leadership do? They go, you know something? We've got to stay focused on prayer and the ministry of the word. And that's what I've asked all of our sector leaders in our church. They are paid by the generous gifts that are given to the church to devote full-time focus, and their focus is to be presenting the gospel, time with non-Christians, sharing their faith, advancing the word of God. But you know, they can't really do that when they have to do all these other tasks, and this is what was happening in the church. They go, well, we can't take the time to meet these needs, but we gotta take care of these widows who are being overlooked. And understand what was happening, guys. This was prejudice in the church. You had the Hebraic Jews who were like the conservative ones that lived by the temple and hard line about following the law. And the Grecian Jews, or the Hellenistic Jews, they were the more liberal ones that, you know, eh, you know, I interpret that a little differently maybe, right? And, and they had this kind of conflict. <laughs> and, and it's kind of like politics today, right? You got some conservative people, you got some liberal people. But, but, but the point is, is that we can all be Christians, amen? And that's what Jesus did. He had a zealot in his group. And he had a sellout with the tax collector. And they would have hated each other in the world. And yet they became Christians. They left those things behind. Are you with me right here, guys? One of the things we need to have a conviction, if we're going to build a great church, is we need to build a church that's diverse and represents the demographics of our city. Yeah. Yeah. It's, not, it, it's not a ring. If you come into a church, it's all black. Or it's all white. Or it's all Asian. In Boston, they're not doing God's will. If you're in Haiti and it's all Haitian, okay. If you're in, you know, China, amen. But in Boston? Yeah. Why? The world's prejudiced sometimes. Yeah. We are, as Christians, we, don't, we, we, we understand. But I believe great leadership comes up with a solution. They go, you know something? We can't allow this conflict in the church. And we can't allow the garbage in the political world. Racism, these types of things to come into the church. Are you with me right here, brothers and right. sisters? We're family. Yeah. And so what do they do? Well, they select men who are full of the spirit yes, to serve and take care of these tasks. And I love it. Um, in our church, we believe we have incredible servants that have stepped up. I really want to lift up Kevin and Jana Dawson. Jane is back there. You know, they do all the administration and count the contribution in the church and, and take care of all the books and make sure, you know, we're a legal entity in Boston, all that kind of stuff. And, 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 you know, if I had to do all of that, we'd all be in trouble. Because yeah. I just don't know what I'm doing. It's not my gift. I'm supposed to focus on prayer and the ministry of the word. Come on. I appreciate Joshua who helps set up and do our sound. It's amazing the servants we have in the church. Uh, one I want to lift up is John and Karen Roseboro. They were in our early service. And they're amazing. They, they lead, lead the Kids Kingdom ministry. And, and we need people. When you're asked to do and serve in Kids Kingdom and teach our kids, guys, that's an incredible honor. You see, these people, it didn't mean that they were limited to only doing that. Guess what Stephen and Philip, who were chosen to serve, guess what they would become later? You guys know? Evangelists in God's kingdom. See, they still preach the word like John and Karen still preach and share their faith. Amen. They have a cranking Bible talk in our church, but they meet needs. Guys, right now, Joseph and Tyler, they're, they're doing way too much. They lead our campus ministry and they're to be focused on prayer and the ministry of the word. But you know something? They got to set up this projector. That's Joseph or Tyler's laptop right there. 
Because we need more people to serve in the church and to say, you know something, let me take that charge. Let me learn it. Let me know how to do it. Let me walk with you. And I'll take that off of you so you can purely focus on, on what God's called you to do. Are you with me right here, guys? Um, we need leadership that's going to be great in the church. You might say, well, I'm not a leader. Well, I have news for you. Guess what Jesus was? A leader. A leader. So in some senses, we're all called to be leaders like Christ. And if everyone in the church was like you, what type of church would this be? Let's come in for a landing here. In Acts chapter 7, Stephen, who was one of those seven, gives the most intense sermon in the Bible. And you know how every great sermon ends with some inspirational end usually? I, I, I want to inspire you. Look at, look at how Stephen ends his sermon here. Chapter 7, verse 51. And our next point is great persecution. You stiff-necked people with uncircumcised hearts and ears. You're just like your fathers. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet your fathers did not persecute? Wow. They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. And now you have betrayed and murdered him. You who have received the law that was put into effect through angels but have not obeyed it. When they heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said. I have seen heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this they covered their ears, yelling at the top of their voices. They all rushed to him, dragged him out of the city, and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep. Stephen confronts the Sanhedrin on their unspirituality. And as he's standing there, he looks up to heaven. And in the Bible, we always see Jesus sitting at the right hand of God. But I believe Jesus is standing in honor of the first Christian martyr to die for the faith. Come on. Wow, in the New Testament church. Oh, on, honoring him. And Stephen's very last words remind us of our Lord. He said, Lord... Don't hold this set against them. Why? Well, because Stephen was just as committed as the 3,000 that were baptized. Why? Because those 3,000 were just as committed as the 120. The 120 were just as committed as the 70. And the 70 were just as committed as the 12. And of course, the 12 were just as committed as their Lord Jesus. How did it happen? Discipling. Brothers and sisters, are you having weekly discipleship times with your discipling partner to get strengthened in your faith and to grow? There was great persecution. You can go online. You can read a bunch of garbage about our church. Lies, wicked persecution. Come on, bro. People claim we love bomb people, which I always thought was a good thing. But then, you know, they go, oh, they love you just so you will join the church. So, well, no, because we're commanded to love, but amen. It's a good thing. They go, they try to control your mind. They brainwash you. That church, we get a lot of persecution on campuses. Yeah. From other religious people, too. Yeah. Other Christian groups. You know, you'd be aware of that group. They teach you got to repent and be baptized. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, that's just because we don't teach what you teach about just believe and you're good to go and you can live however you want. Nope. We hold to the Bible, guys. And there are going to be people that hate us for it. I think I need my brain washed from all the worldly garbage I've seen in the past. With the word of God, amen? Now, they're implying manipulation and mind control. Of course, that's a wicked sin, and, and we're against that. And you see the danger of extreme groups that, that do stuff like that. But, you know, people will accuse God's church of that kind of stuff. And for some, it's some, some, so unimaginable that someone could be killed for their faith. That's how far modern Christendom has drifted. We want to close in Acts chapter 8. In verse 1, it says, And Saul was there giving approval to his death. Now we're introduced to Saul, who we'll talk about in our next section uh, next week. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him, but Saul began destroying the church, going from house to house. So remember earlier, they went from house to house preaching the gospel, but Satan always follows with persecution, right? He dragged them off, men and women, and put them into prison. But verse, verse 4 is our key verse. Those who have been scattered preached the word 
wherever they went. If we read on, for time, I'm, I'm not going to read it, but in Acts 8, Philip goes to Samaria and he preaches the gospel. And look at what verse 8 says, as, as Philip, one of those who was scattered, preaches. It says, so there was great joy in that city. And that's our last point, great joy. Guys, there was great joy because the gospel was being preached and miracles were being done. But how did this happen? Persecution. They, the church in Jerusalem gets persecuted and they realize, wait a second, Jesus said we're supposed to go from Jerusalem, Judea to Samaria. So they scatter all the disciples. So this was not like a, they were scared and just kind of ran off and scattered. This was a planned scattering. And we know that because in verse 4, they preached the word wherever they want. Imagine if all the leaders in our church said, guys, we're going to stay here in Boston, but we're going to scatter you guys. And so we're going to take a Mecca and Daniel and Ryan and Forrest. We're going to put them in a plane and parachute them to Portland, Maine. Come on. Number one atheistic city in the, world, in the nation, just so you know. Come on. Drop them there. And know what's going to happen when we drop them there? What's going to happen? A church is going to form. Yeah. Because disciples preach the word wherever they went. Come on. You get Crystalina and Tutu and Tito and Junior and Ben and Sarah. We say, hey guys, we're going to group you guys together and, and, and we parachute them to, you know, Vermont or parachute them to Saudi Arabia, North Korea. I believe if you're a sold out disciple, a church will form. Yeah, come on, bro. Because we're all committed to Jesus. And Jesus was one guy. Don't underestimate the power of one person Amen. who holds to the word of God. And there was great joy all around. As we close, I just want you to consider, can you believe what God's done? Think about what God's done the last year and the friendships we've formed. And look around right now. Would we all know each other? Like, this is kind of a random grouping of people. Like, we all would probably hang out in the world, you know what I mean? Like, 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 like. And yet the blood of Christ, I mean, you got athletes, you got people that are into Digimon cards, and you got people that are, you know, black and white, and, and, and uh, political spectrums all over the place, and, and, and yet we're all together worshiping God. And God's grown us from 53 to and th almost 130 souls in the church. And we're on our road to 300. We believe. That's the vision we put out. We put out in the next couple of years. We want to see the church get to 300 souls. And, and I believe with all my heart that we'll hit 200. And I believe we can get to 300 this year if God intends. But it's going to take you going, if everyone in the church was like me, what type of church would this be? And to God be the glory. Thank you. Guys.